of the white bull mate podcast and it's an absolute pleasure to have on the show today a pioneer in the sport and the bellator flyweight champion of the world liz carmu so again like i said at the start of that it's it's a real honor to have you on here because you know i've been watching you since you know i became a fan of the sport so liz tells you know again you're coming off that real big like you know bellator flyweight uh flyweight title win so you know what are the feelings like after that uh you know it was hard uh with trying to really enjoy and live in that moment, just because there was controversy around the fight, uh, which in my mind and in the decision that I felt like was done correctly was really no controversy. Uh, But she put it into question. So it made me doubt for a second. I went back and rewatched it. I was like, no way. Uh, But just seeing all the feedback from, from some people and stuff, it kind of took a damper off of it, but then realized all the effort I put in and again, rewatching it, now I've rewatched it a few times. I see the same thing and it was the best call I could have made, but it took a little bit for it to settle in. And now things are kind of falling back into place. Yeah. And, you know, and you kind of, you know, spoke about it a little, t- you know, about it there a little bit too, that, you know, people were talking about it, you know, being a controversial, like, you know, finish, but like you said, it's like, I mean, Juliana was kind of stuck in a real bad position, a crucifix, it's a real position, like a real you know, tough position to get out of, especially in that and in, in the way you had it there. But you still got the win, but you know, you're in Hawaii out of all places. And I know I've heard you say in other interviews that Hawaii is a real special place for you. So, you know, what was the celebration like? You know, were you able to enjoy some good food, you know, party a little bit, you know, with the family? Uh, you know, what, what was the feelings like after the win? Yeah, I definitely got to enjoy the food. I'm a big foodie. And so I had planned out like a foodie adventure for about 14 different spots that I wanted to go check out. Go. And so <laughs> I tried to, to go and hit up everything on the list and the food was all amazing. Uh, afterwards, uh, we just got a little, out a little bit later than we anticipated. And because I had a larger group than what I expected, we weren't able to go eat at some of the spots I wanted to just had to wait till I got home. Um, but spending time in Hawaii, the beautiful weather, getting to take my son to be an island child, run around and stuff and see some of the beautiful sights. It was great. Yeah, you know, I mean, you said you were a foodie, so you know what what food are we talking about? Are we talking about steak, a little bit of everything, like you know, it's like you know, cupcakes, like what are we talking uh, yeah, about? A little, bit, a little bit of everything. So the first uh, first stop was I really wanted to have a wagyu steak. I had I got to try one in February, and it was amazing. And so go. that's all I've been thinking about since February is I want another wagyu steak. That's gonna be my celebratory meal. Uh, so we went to go get a wagyu steak, and then uh, a lot of the sweet spots like Ube Hawaii. I really love Ube. Mm-hmm. And so there was like Ube Pandan places that we got to go check out. There was a, a Japanese slash Okinawan restaurant I got to go check out to get that taste of home. Um, we tried uh, anywhere from soft serve ice creams, cookies, cookie ice creams, uh, mango, cheesecakes, you name it. I tried everything. <laughs> oh, man, I'm hungry now. I'm not going to lie. You know, probably after the interview, I'm probably just going to be grubbing on like cookies and all that. So. Nice. <laughs> So, so, so there you go. So, so like, you know, were you there? Like, I know you said you, you had all these spots, but were you there for, you know, a long period of time, like probably like a week or something, or it was kind of like, in, you know, a couple of days and then just get right back to training. Yeah, we were only there for about uh, four days. I, I definitely want to get back into training, uh, but my coaches, teammates, friends, family, everybody's like, hey, just enjoy the moment take the time. And then I was like, you know, I'm going to get back, back to it right away when I get back uh, from my trip. And I did go back to the gym, but it was a slew of different things breaking down in my house from inside the house, all the plumbing going, getting shot, AC breaking, every vehicle being broken. (laughs) Then as much as like on my agenda to go back to training at a whole list of things I had to fix at home. Hey, I mean, even, even the Bellator flyweight champion of the world has to has to deal with all these things. So that's oh, pretty yeah. Funny. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but Liz, you know, kind of like I said at the start, you know, you're a pioneer in the sport, right? And, they, you know, a lot of, you know, a question I like asking fighters when I get on here is how they get their start in the sport, right? Some people, you know, stumble upon the sport. Other people just, you know, get brought into it through family. So for you, what was your start? You know, what what, what got you into MMA or just combat sports in general? Yeah, so I was originally uh, in the Marine Corps, and I had dibble dabbled a little bit in different uh, forms of karate when I was a kid, like Taekwondo, Aikido, traditional Okinawan karate. 
Um, but I never really stuck with it. We didn't have the money to do it. And then I never, I was just a hobbyist. I didn't have the attention span. I was like, cool, I did it for a month. Let's move on to gymnastics next month. Yeah. You know, so you don't appreciate it. But I, I took away things from that and lessons. And then I was in the Marine Corps. I was constantly striving to be the best at the, the physical fitness test. And I wanted to try new things. And there are people I worked with like, why don't you try training in MMA? And when I first watched the sport, I was disgusted. I saw a gory fight with the fighter who won being super egotistical in the face of the opponent that lost. And I was like, I don't like this. This is no, (laughs) this is not. And like, look, that was the worst representation of the sport. I swear it's not normally that gory. And people are usually usually really respectful to each other. Like, it's not like that. Mm. Um, So I started off with just BJ Penn's book. I started with just doing some of his workouts, trying out the diets, trying to learn the techniques and failing at horribly. Um, and then, uh, when I got out of the Marine Corps, as I was in the Marine Corps, I started becoming a fan of watching MMA, realizing there was more to it than just that one fight that I saw Mm -hmm. and that the workouts I was doing, the diets, that was just a small aspect of it. And there was so much more depth to the sport. And that's what really intrigued me is because I was starting to see the hybrid MMA fighters, um, start to develop and advance further than those that were specialized in one different sport or another. Mm-hmm. And that really intrigued me is being able to learn all these things and not just focus on one style. And when I got out, I was like, you know what? I want to try this. My roommate at the time, uh, we talked about how I really wanted to get an MMA when I got out of the Marine Corps. So she locked me out of the house, made me go to the gym down the street. I tried it out for like six hours straight, just one class after the other. And I was hooked from that point on. I mean, and like you said right there, right, you, you, you did one class after another six hours, We're, you know, the people in the gym, they're like, you know, does she have anything else to do? Like, you know, <laughs> you're, you know not, not going home, not breaking stuff. So like, what was the experience that like that first day, right? Because, you know, for a lot of people, right, their first day at an MMA gym, first day at jiu-jitsu gym, first day at any gym, right? It's, it's a tough one, right? They get beat up and all that. So for you, what was your experience? Did you did you get beat up just like the rest of us or you were just oh, absolutely I definitely got beat up I definitely 100 percent got beat up uh but I was just a hard-headed marine and so if the coach said like hey I want you to take this person down I didn't know what a takedown was but I played tackle football as a kid so I'm like just smash through them. eventually I'll figure it out I just want you to hit them as hard as you can don't stop till I say stop like I was a marine at that point fresh out of the marine corps if you told me yeah. to go until I was dead I'll go till I'm dead <laughs> so with every class I was like this is kind of cool. Like, I don't know, I don't understand any of this and the possibilities of growth and understanding that it had a glass ceiling of possibility that was really appealing for me. Because after having been in the Marine Corps, it's like, you can only run so many miles and run so fast, mm. lift so much weight. There's, there's a cutoff of possibility there. And in MMA, it just didn't seem like that was possible. It just seemed like the possibilities in, in every type of technique that involved it was just unrelenting mm-hmm. as long as you put the effort into it it had endless possibilities of which you could learn 100 percent. and then like like you said there right like you said at the very start it's kind of like you 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 wanted to get into MMA and like you know eventually you know for everyone they start training and then they eventually get to their first fight so for you like you know after that that first day that you got beat up in the six hours at the you know at the gym you know when did you realize you're like okay I think I'm ready for my first you know whether that be professional or amateur fight that the coaches were like, okay, I I think she's ready to get in there. Uh, So when I started, I started a month, a month before my 26th birthday Mm -hmm. and going into it, there were so many other people that had wrestled their whole life growing up where they had at least done like boxing their whole life. They had something, some type of combat sport experience that Mm -hmm. they had been involved in before they decided to go the route of MMA. So they were bringing that to it. I was the only person in there that did not really have a background. And so I was like, well, I have a lot of catch up to do. I don't know anything about any of these things. So I I went into it with the the understanding that I had to commit to being in there for at minimum five hours a day, six days a week. So I was in there, I'd go to school in the morning, as soon as I got out of school, go to the gym and go until the gym closed and then some. And and that was kind of my idea is that I just need to play catch up and learn. When Mm -hmm. I was originally told is I'd be lucky if I had an amateur fight within the first two years of training, especially considering I had no experience. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, cool. Like if I just get a smoker, that's be awesome. I just want to see what I'm capable of. And I want to test out my skill set. What I didn't know is that because I was committed in there and I was so open-minded and my work ethic, what anticipated as being amateur in two years, maybe at best Mm -hmm. turned into my first amateur fight after three or four months. And then nobody was willing to fight me after that. So I went pro a month later. <laughs> there you go. I mean, what, what, were, what were the reactions around the, like the gym too, right? After you get your first uh, win, uh, you know, after your first amateur fight, is everyone at the gym just like, 
they were just like we didn't we didn't see this coming or everyone was kind of like yeah man like you know she's in here for five hours a day and like obviously it was supposed to happen obviously she was gonna you know get that first w after that first amateur win so you know what was everyone's reaction like there uh, within the actual MMA team, they all yeah. didn't seem like they're surprised. They understood the work ethic. I was always willing to be in there and, and just be a sponge of information. Even if it meant like, Hey, you need a body just to try and hold you down. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'll help mm-hmm. you. Like I was always willing to be there for anybody that had a fight coming up. And then I was trying to get into every single class where the other people were surprised is, is like some of the, just the members that didn't fight, like they're like, slip your head. And I was like, this combination is too long. And like, didn't you just have your first pro fight? How do you not know this? I'm like, I've never done this before. They're like, how have you never done this? You're a pro. I'm like, I've only been training for four months. I, I'm still learning. You've been training longer than I have. Yeah. Uh, so for some of the people, they were just surprised at not necessarily um, that I won or that I was in there fighting, but just at my lack of experience and the success that I started having very quickly. No, yeah, hundred percent. And you know, obviously, like you said there, right? You know, it, it took a while. People didn't want to fight you, so obviously, you know, you got you got a couple more wins under your belt. And you know, obviously, the the, the question that yeah, you probably get asked at every interview you do, right? You you get the call up from the UFC mm-hmm. saying, "Hey, we're gonna do the first ever, uh, you know, female fight in the UFC." And like like I said, you're a pioneer in the sport. You're the first one to do it. So you know, what was that call like? Because you know, at the time, right, like. It's not like today that you see, you know, females main events in cards now. Like, at, you know, at that time, it was very something really, really new and something that, you know, caught, you know, something that was caught the attention of many, many around the world. So, you know, what was the feelings like when you got the call from the UFC that they're like, you know, finally about to pull the trigger to have that female um, um, card? Uh, it was really exciting. You know, um, I, I used to have this policy that between the hours of 9 p.m. to 9 a.m., I never touched my phone. And mm-hmm. so people knew, like, you can text me or call me, but I'm never going to look at my phone until it's 9 a.m. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I look at my phone and it's like 7 a.m. And I'm like, why are there so many missed texts and phone calls? Whatever. Put it away. Keep going. And I'm like, seriously, why are they calling so much? And I finally answer it. And my manager at the time was like, hey, have you not been paying attention to your phone? It's like my, all my coaches have called me. My manager has called me. I'm like, okay, now this is something different. Like, hey, we've been trying to get a hold of you. The UFC is looking for somebody to fight Ronda Rousey, make it the headline fight, big deal, make history. Every, every other person has said no. Okay, yeah, I'm in. Mm-hmm. They're like, do you want to win? Do you want to like, no. I, you guys call me and ask me if I want to fight. It doesn't matter who it is, what it is, where, anything. The answer is always yes. I mean, I've taken fights on nine days notice, seven days notice, three weeks notice. My answer has always been, yeah, I'm in. Mm-hmm. And then my coach would be like, no, that's not a good fight for you. They made the decision. But ultimately, I always say yes. And I have to go back and be like, hey, guys, does this make sense for my fight career or any of these things? Like, no, it doesn't. Don't do that fight. We're telling, we're saying no. You can say yes, but we're saying no. Um, so it was, it was not a doubt in anybody's head. I mean, my coach is calling me just to ask me, basically just to let me know the opportunity was there. My manager was calling just to see if I would take it, even though he knew the answer. Everybody knew the answer. Um, and that's all it was to me at that time. I didn't realize what I was signing up for in terms of history making of the opportunity or really understanding that how many women they had already asked mm-hmm. and every single one of them said no. And I was the only one that was like, yeah, I'll do it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it just didn't occur to me until later on. I was like, oh, this is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, talk, talk to us a little bit about like, you know, obviously, like you said, like this is a lot. So you probably had to go through a bunch of media, media, media interviews interviews with people probably never seen the sport ever in their lives probably asking you the most basic questions so like for you like you know what was the feeling like throughout the whole fight week realizing that it was such a big deal and uh yeah and then after that tell us about you know just the feeling in the arena walking through you know walking to that octagon you know seeing that many people for that fight yeah you know um it- Leading up to it, I didn't realize how much publicity, how much media that the UFC was going to ask for. Mm-hmm. Um, on top of me working a full-time job, I was also trying to train full-time for this fight. And I had no time off. There was no recovery. There was no doing the right things to downtime to get ready for this fight. If I was between running to the gym, whether it was I was working there or I was training there, I was doing media calls for two hours. And I was like, that's the most I can give you. And they're like, well, we need you to go to this TV station at 7 a.m. Like, I guess I can squeeze that in right before I have to go to work. Okay, let me try that. <laughs> um, and so it was it was really stressful trying to manage all that. And then the actual media tour before the fight, I'm flying, I'm going to Las Vegas, I'm going to Los Angeles, all over the place to do these things. 
And uh, and then it's like, oh, okay, well, I haven't really met Ronda Rousey. And now we're going to meet each other doing this media thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's just another person. And I guess other people are super intimidated by her. So she wasn't expecting me to just be like, hey, what's up? I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> so it's like, we have that. And then actual fight week pops up. And they're like, cool, we need you to do eight hours of media a day before the fight. I'm like, oh, my oh God. wow. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. I'm going all over the place. And, um, but it was great. You know, uh, it, trying to understand how to manage that and how to deal with being articulate and being able to present myself, being comfortable in those situations while also trying to manage my career. It taught me how to be able to do that and to handle that stress. And since then, any media tour I've ever done since, like, this is a breeze. Yeah. Nothing has ever compared to that. That is the most stressful. And everything since then has been super easy. And then when I walked out to that arena, the only way I can describe it is the atmosphere of all the people in anticipation of this fight, whether it was negative or positive, the feeling that I had was electric. Mm -hmm. You could feel the hair stand up on your skin, walking through the stadium, the energy of those people, you couldn't help but be so excited for that mm -hmm. fight and so charged by the anticipation everybody wanted to see us make history that it was just, it was beyond exciting. I remember being like, I, again, that's something I've never really felt before is going into it and feeling how everybody felt in that stadium. And I could feel all the negativity, all the positivity, but it all just became one energy together wanting to see this fight happen. No, a hundred percent. And, you know, like you kind of talked about it there, right. You know, just the energy of everyone in that, in that arena. Right. So like, and, and giving you chills, like Obviously, we had that big fight a couple of weeks ago with, uh, you know, Katie Taylor and Amanda Serrano. So did that give you any flashbacks to, to your fight? Obviously, watching that because, you know, even though it's boxing, I, you know, I do believe you're also, you know, a big proponent of, you know, that fight happening in boxing, right? In a main event in Madison Square Garden. So when you were watching that fight, did you just get flashbacks to, to, to that moment of your fight? Yeah, in all honesty, when I watch, uh, whether it's Muay Thai, boxing, MMA, whenever I watch an opportunity for women to be able to step up and headlining a fight, mm. I, I get that that same feel and that same energy and that excitement. If anything, it's uh, honestly a little bit more intense because mm. when I watch other people, it's like I get that gut feeling like, oh, it's so hard to handle and to see other people getting hit, like watching it is so different now that I've experienced it and have a different understanding, but the excitement of every opportunity that women have to step up and to put on a great show, uh, it's, it's so cool. And it does take me back to that moment and realizing how I felt in that moment and wondering what they're experiencing themselves. No, hundred percent. And, you know, I do have to ask though, like, you know, you watching the Katie Taylor and Amanda Serrano, do you think that was the right decision too? Cause you know, a lot of people saying that it was, I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a real close fight back and forth. Some people are on one side of the fence, other people are on the other. So for you, what, what was your, your thoughts on the fight? You know, when it comes to boxing, I have a really hard time, uh, like judging it and understanding it. Cause there's certainly been times which I can understand why, when you have like a boxing commission that's mm. judging the May fight, why it could be so skewed because it's apples and oranges. You can't yeah. view and judge it the same way. And so I definitely, when I watch boxing, I'm just more like, Oh, the, the speed, the power is really what I'm just watching. It's just, it's so impressive, their movement and everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not even trying to be in there as somebody that can judge a fight and have any understanding because I'm not in the ballpark of what they do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 100%, 100%. So yeah, so yeah, so let's to, to, to bring it back to your career, right? You know, just to, you know, fast forward to, to present day, right? You know, you you finally get that 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 um that title win, right? That, that Bellator Flyweight uh, Championship. So for you, like, you know, what are your goals for 2022, right? Because, you know, I've heard you say in other interviews that you want to bring that uh, a title fight to, to, to Japan. So is that still, um, you know, one of the goals for 2022 or, um, you know, as is, is, is the goals change since then? No, that's still the huge goal is I really want to, I mean, I grew up in Okinawa, Japan, mm -hmm. and if I could get a fight to be in Okinawa, that would be phenomenal for me to be able to mm -hmm. stay and to be able to enjoy the experience, but also just because I don't ever remember growing up there being large sporting events like that. And mm. when I was in Okinawa, I'd never heard of MMA. I had no experience of it. That was a mainland Japan thing. Um, so to have an opportunity to bring it to Okinawa, that would mean the world. But even if I can just bring it back to Japan and to open up a whole, because as far as I can tell, women showcasing in MMA and being the main event hasn't mm. been this huge ordeal. And I would love to see that happen in Japan and then be able to speak out on some of the cultural differences and things that I've experienced and to bring people's awareness to Japan, just how beautiful that culture is. And then be able to go to Okinawa afterwards and be able to see home because I've been in to Okinawa since 2006. So wow. it's been a really long time and I miss it. And it would just be one of my like, 
check marks of my life to be able to say that I fought in Japan. No, yeah, 100%, 100%. And, I, and I'm and i rooting for you to, you know, for that to actually happen. So, uh, you Thank know, you. Liz, yeah, so Liz, at the, you know, like I said at the very start, you know, I appreciate you giving me the time of day for the interview because, you know, it means a lot. You know, I've been watching you since I became a fan of the source. So, the, you know, the fact that I get the opportunity to talk to you is, is so freaking awesome. So um, before we go, do you want to plug in all your social media so everyone watching can, uh, can go and follow you? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm on Facebook as Liz Carmouche Official, and I'm also on Instagram and Twitter as I am Girl Rilla. There you go. There you go. So Liz, once again, thank you. And to everyone watching, peace.